Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Canto Conversations. My name is Julian Wilkins. I'm Government Relations and Public Affairs Director for Digicel Group, and I'm also the former Chairman of Canto. I'm going to be your moderator this morning. Uh, before we begin, first, I'd like to uh, offer an apology to our audience. Um, we, we had some spam challenges uh, on our last webinar, and we at, we at Canto are truly, truly sorry and apologize for this. We have put things in place to try and avoid this happening again. So welcome once again to Canto Conversations. In fact, uh, I was looking back, this is actually our 24th webinar. Um, we actually started the first week of April, which is some three and a half months ago, which is the time has really flown. And uh, in those 24 webinars, we've actually had 12 CEOs. In fact, uh, uh, Fanta, who I'll introduce in a little while, is our 12th CEO. And um, we're very proud of the fact that at least half of our CEOs that have come on so far have been women. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Fanta Williams, Country Manager of Digicel, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And she's going to share her views on how organizations can innovate and navigate through these challenging times. Fanta, welcome to Canto Conversations. Julian, thank you. It is such a pleasure um, to join you today. And so I want to say hello to uh, the wider audience um, and to the members of your team uh, as well online today. Um, and I'm very excited to, to have this chat with you. You know, Fanta, I, I've been to St. Vincent a, a few times now and I've come to your office and I really I see how you work and how busy you are as CEO in St. Vincent. And um, I, I really appreciate you spending the time with us today so much. Thank you. So um, to our audience, let me just say, uh, please post your questions in the chat and please uh, mute your microphones. So let's uh, dive straight in. And Fanta, let me just say, um, how are you? How, how are you doing? Um, I'm great, I'm great. I think, you know, 99% of this is really mindset. And it's really um, how, how you keep your, your, yourself just, you know, mentally agile to, to, to what, it, what is happening around you. Uh, there are good days and they are not so good days. Um, but I think, you know, th these times we, we have to see the, the, the blessings, as I like to say, the nuggets of, 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 of things that are, are special and unique, that are unique to the opportunities that we are now, you know, being able to receive based on the challenges that we're seeing. So um, I, I try to keep in a good mindset. Um, I think that helps everybody around me if I'm in a good mindset. Um, but it's work, you know, and it, and it is constant work. So um, let's just dive straight in. I'm, I'm happy that, uh, uh, you know, that you've kept a balanced, balanced approach. I think that's important. Um, but one of the things, um, Fanta, is that, uh, you know, we've had, um, you're actually uh, CEO woman number six uh, that we've been interviewing. And we're yes. very proud of that. We, we like to demonstrate that we do, in fact, have uh, some very good women, uh, some very good women uh, CEOs uh, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, let me just ask you, uh, I think it'd be good to, for our audience just to give, get some of your background. Maybe you can offer some advice for young Caribbean women uh, who 
for making a career in the ICT industry? Oh, um, absolutely. I, I think I'll start first with a bit of, of my background. So um, um, I, as much as I, 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 I consider myself a Caribbean woman, and I am a Caribbean woman, I grew up in Trinidad, um, but I was born in Canada. You're in very Sunni. I love that. Father. Yes, a very proud Trinidadian father who, you know, made sure that, you know, my formative years were spent in the Caribbean, immersed in, you know, a very beautiful culture. Um, he was, you know, very much a revolutionary and so was my mother at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so they instilled in me this, this, this just belief in, in yourself. Um, and, you know, that, that saw me through, right through, you know, my life. I think, you know, when I started to to look at what I wanted to do in life, you know, I, I got into things like debating society and and because I, I like to argue, as my mother said, you know, um, <laughs> and then I, I took that in, in university. I went to the University of Windsor um, and I, I took that into student government. I was student council president of my university. Um, I actually was student of the year at my university to, because of my um, community um, efforts and, and community development, not just for the school at the time, for, but for the city of Windsor as well. Um, started in my career um, in technology. I started with Xerox Canada in, in Canada. And then at, at, as I journeyed wow. through um, my career, um, worked with Microsoft, worked with, with, with Novell at the time. I got very interested in technology, not necessarily a techie person, but what I always liked about technology was the fact that it existed to solve problems, you know, right. and it existed to make life easier. And I was always a person able to, you know, help people understand their challenges and how, how to solve them. And then so I found that I could find a natural relationship between my ability to do that and, and then what were sometimes complex ideas. Um, again, the Caribbean called me, you know, as it, as it always did. Um, and I made the leap and decided to, you know, to return to the Caribbean and, 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 you know, see what was available to me. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life because um, the life I have now is 100% because of that, that, that risk I took and that journey that I made. Um, and who I am today is a culmination of all the, all the Caribbean-ness that I have been able to experience personally and both professionally. And that segues me into the wonderful women that I work with. Every one of the, of the women that you've interviewed prior to myself, I've had some, some connection with. I've worked with them at some point in my career. And, and what I'd like to emphasize with that is that we are a sisterhood. Many of us, um, they, some, of my, some of these women sit in my cluster, so we are talking to each other almost daily. Um, or they have been women that I've worked with in the past. And I think what, what is so powerful about, about the Caribbean CEO kind of sisterhood is that you know, we really do work as a fraternity. Um, we lean in on each other when we need support. Um, all of us have different unique strengths and talents and we've learned how to use that diversity of talent to better ourselves to make better business decisions to be better ceos um, and so i really you know want to say publicly to them thank you all of them um, that have come whether it be nakima shrivan shivan i mean geraldine pitt is somebody early in my career Geraldine, absolutely. was a powerhouse in, in, yes. in Digicel at the time. One of the first, um, one of the first women CEOs, I think. Uh, absolutely yeah. was. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, at the time, sometimes you don't understand the influence that certain people will have on who you are, right? Mm -hmm. But there are things that I can pull from all of them, um, including her, that I think allow me to understand better how to navigate this, this CEO world um, and also within the very dynamic industry that we work, telecommunications is, you know, I, I don't think there's any other industry like it. You know, it's daily, it's different. You know, it, it's, it's customers, it's relationships, and it's technology all in one. And so, you know, the ability to, to lean in on all the talent around you, I think is critical to success. And for Women who want to, to get to leadership roles, I, I think, you know, I was listening to a, a podcast yesterday of, you know, a couple of female leaders that I know also in the business. And, mm. you know, a couple of things just jumped out at me for when, when they spoke was, you know, be excellent, be excellent where you are. 
-hmm. you know, you don't know when it's going to happen. I can't tell you that I sat down at a crystal ball and said, you know, one day I would be CEO of Digital St. Vincent Limited. I started with this company 14 years ago, um, overseeing the retail stores. And as I said to you, Julian, being on the road every day, whether it be in any of the Grenadine Islands or through the rural communities, that's, that's where I started my work. I, I could not have told you that I would have walked this path. But, but what I do know is if you are excellent where you are and you commit yourself to doing good work and you can each day look yourself in the eye and say, you know what, I've done today what, 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 I, what I wanted to do and what I, what I needed to do. Um, and you find people who are willing to come on that journey with you, then the leadership naturally comes. Um, so do good work, be yourself, don't be afraid to fail. I think I, <laughs> I say to people, I'm here because of all the warning letters I have on my file. And I, and I say that proudly <laughs> because you get warning letters when you take risks and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, but you always learn. Mm -hmm. um, and it teaches you compassion and it teaches you, you know, empathy, which I think are also important attributes. I can't say that you're, we're perfect at displaying them all the time in this very demanding industry that we're in. Um, yes. But I know what it feels like to have that little tingle in your belly because you think you haven't done something right and um, you wonder <laughs> what's going to happen. Um, yeah. You can survive those. I am testimony to that. Um, and all of that, the culmination of all of that is leadership. And you will find your way because I also ultimately believe that what you are seeking is always also seeking you. Uh, fascinating insight, uh, uh, Fanta. I'm actually interested in, um, when you were studying, were you actually in college or school? Were you, were you studying in technology or did, did you? because you know, you've been doing oh, this for all of your career. No, I, I, stu I studied political science in school. I, I was going to go into, into uh, international relations. I wanted to go work at The Hague or at the UN. Um, that, that was oh. my, you know, my thought process. And then I so thought- So you could have done, done my job in government relations then? <laughs> and I could have, I could have tried to do your job, Julia, you know? <laughs> but yeah, that was, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. You know, and as I said, because I love to debate and I love to argue and I love to get my, my point heard. Um, and then, as I said, I went into student government and, and as, as a student council president, you actually end up being an operational person. You run a business. And so mm. I ran the student council, the pub, the newspaper, uh, the radio station. And then, you know, you kind of catch the bug for, for business. And then I decided to do, continue my education in business as well, again, at the University of Windsor. And then, so I just started down that field. Um, Xerox and, and, and then working with a company called Soft Choice kind of happened because of my sales um, kind of ah, lead. Background. I, right. Yes, I, I'm a salesperson. I, I like to talk to people about products and figure out how I can get them engaged and excited and then purchasing them. So a lot of, you know, where my, my marriage of technology and, and sales came in is how I ended up where I was. And then when I, I got to the Caribbean, I, I found that that sales um, drive and the, the sales acumen that I had um, is, is really kind of led me into to Digicel. I was actually in Trinidad at the time when Digicel mm -hmm. launched. And was so enamored with the company because I thought I've never seen there was gorillas, people in gorilla suits running through the streets. And you know, I remember I went to a store and a phone was like twenty, thirty dollars. And I thought, I have oh. never seen anything like this. This is unprecedented. Um, and then, you know, again, because your journey is your journey, um, when I when I came to St. Vincent, because I actually have familial um connections here, um, I ended up with the, the opportunity to work for Digicel here, and I can tell you it was no different. It's still, you know, it's an exciting, dynamic, and interesting company. So, yeah, I didn't start out to 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 get into the technology realm, but as I said, mm. you know, the good thing about university, and I used to tell, you know, students coming into universities, and also when I was mentoring their parents about, you know, you know how to help their children be successful in university, I always said it's about being teachable. Um, you know, university and post-secondary education is not about giving you a title at the end when you walk out. It's about how teachable are you? Mm. Can you stretch your mind and learn new ideas and concepts? And then can you take that and apply it 
to whatever it is you do. So for me, I, you know, I like to learn new things. Um, and so Digicel just gave me an opportunity to do that. And fortunately for me, within Digicel, I've been able to, to work in a lot of different departments. As I said, I started out in retail, but I've also worked in business solutions, managing the business solutions team. I've worked in corporate sales, um, mm -hmm. then, then again in, in retail. So I've been able to touch a lot of different areas. Um, and I think it's about having a passion for what you do, because if you have the passion, then I believe you have the foundation to be successful at anything you wish to do. Um, because that's going to set the tone for how much in, you invest in, in what you're doing. Um, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's thanks, thanks for sharing your background. Uh, I, I, I can see why, you know, all your experiences that you've had has really made you into the, uh, the lady that you are today. Um, so let me just say for our audience, please feel free um, to uh, pop down any questions on the chat and we will try to get to those a little bit later. Um, Samantha, I'm thinking though, most of the islands, you know, we're, we're free, well, uh, nearly four months into this uh, pandemic. Um, most of the islands uh, have locked down. Some are reopening now, uh, et cetera. But I understand St. Vincent, um, when it came to the lockdown, sort of took, took a different approach. Uh, maybe you could share that with us. It would be quite interesting. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, yes, we did. We did. We did take somewhat of a different approach in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, and, and I think the things that were, were different in, in, in terms of how we, we really navigated the, the COVID, um, you know, the COVID experience from the beginning was we focused very much on um, contact tracing. So what you found was, you know, a lot of dissemination of information um, about you know how to be you know how to take proper precautions with COVID. Um, they went out very early on, in ensuring that consistently information was going out on social media platforms, etc. But they were also you know doing a lot of contact tracing. So um, it's it's a matter of you know knowing who is potentially at risk and who they have come in contact with. And if you can see, I think, you know, St. Vincent has had a total of, you know, 35 active cases um, over, over the span of the period and, and no fatalities, which I think, you know, is, I think is a testament to the work so of the excellent. Ministry of Health. Um, mm. We have worked very closely with the Ministry of Health from the beginning. And I have to tell you, there are, there's such dedication and, and such brilliance with, within that, that, that team um, in terms of their understanding of, of just communicable diseases and, and, you know, the precautions that you take and, and the due diligence that they, they take in, in making sure that they understand what are the right things to do. I think some of the things that we did in this market as well is while we did... <coughs> you know, keep people, you know, focused on precaution. They also limited risk in, in during things like public holidays when people might have felt to free up a bit more and, and be out. All, all of our public holidays were actually lockdown periods. Um, but I have to say to the citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they also did their part as well. Because um, while they, it was always about enforcement of, of you know, making sure that you, you stay in on those public holidays to mitigate mm -hmm. risk, um, they were compliant. And, and I think that's, that's you know, a, a, a massive part of it as well, as you see as it's happening in other areas. So yes, it was a different approach. And, and what I, I tell people is, I don't think there's any best approach to how to handle COVID. I think you, you work with first the, the science, what the science is telling you. Um, you also look at, at your, your country and understanding your, your citizenry and what, what their behavior is. And, and then you, you take the, the, the decision as to what you think is the right thing to do. Um, I think what we did worked for us. Would it work for everybody? I, don't, I can't say that because I think every, every place is unique. Um, but I can't say in, in the way that we've done things that it has not worked for us. I think we've, we've done you know, a very good job of doing that. And also what it has allowed us to do is in as best as we could um, sustain the economy as well. So um, uh, whilst you're answering that question, uh, a friend of ours, uh, Flavia Lima, you know Flavia? Yes, hi Flavia, yes. Uh, she, um, she didn't have a question, but she said, 
fascinating and inspiring as always Fanta. Haven't seen you in a while my friend. Great to know that you're doing well. Oh, I, yes. We, we, I, I try to stay connected to people who I connect to. And so Flavia, somebody, yes, it was many years ago we would have worked together. And so t- I have to say thank you. And, and I hope she is doing well as well and staying safe. Excellent. Um, so uh, we've got one or two questions coming in, actually. So I'm going to give those to you. But um, how has uh, COVID-19 affected uh, Digital St. Vincent uh, in terms of its operations and revenue. Can you speak a bit about that? Sure. Um, start, we'll start first with operations. Um, you know, early on in, 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 you know, once we had cases in March um, and we started to see an increase in those cases, um, we took the decision to, to put in um, a work from home policy. So um, at one point, the entire office was working from home, including our call center. Um, so we would have so gotten additional have a, laptops and these things and, and then um, put in, in place um, a work from home policy um, that, that we had in place for probably, a, I would say, a, about two months where, where most of okay. our staff work from home. We shut down our head office and then we put additional precautionary measures in our retail stores. In some, in some areas, we would have shortened the hours. Um, again, to mitigate the risks. Um, but yes, we, I, and, and persons on the outside would know this because the business continued to run, but the majority of our business was being done from home and, and via Teams um, through communication and so forth. And, and even our call center that supports seven markets um, um, was working from, from home as well. So that was operationally one of the key things. Um, in, in, in the in, in in the initial cases, it was about making sure that people wore masks. We did a lot of town halls to educate persons on how to be, you know, how to take precautions. Um, we had a hotline here, so we also advised them that if, if they have any questions or concerns about COVID, just make sure they were always getting credible and reputable information. So the hotline was able to provide that as well as, you know, links to the World Health Organization, etc. We kept a very open discourse so managers were having you know constant engagement with the, with their staff we were we were also feeding into our staff and making sure they were okay we were using online messaging you know and all of these things to stay connected and stay communicating with, with, with each other but we were able to keep the business running um in terms of how it's impacted us financially i mean you know saint vincent and the grenadines is driven you know very much by tourism um predominantly in the Grenadine Islands. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, many of the major, you know, hotels, et cetera, shut down um, in March. And, Mm -hmm. you know, people would say, oh, well, that's really the end of your, of your tourism, you know, kind of season. But what they didn't realize is that we have a major bump in activity that happens in March around Easter, Um, particularly our yachting community. Um, okay. We have major festivals that are happening both in, in Beckway and Union that drive a lot of regional um, travel to the island, as well as, as many yachts, you know, come and, and come into the island around that period. So mm. that last bump that you would get in the tourism, in, you know, that tourism season, you know, we would have lost because, you know, the cruise ships would have stopped coming in and that trickles down to your to your, you know, your tour bus drivers, your, your taxi drivers, and, and also another area of the business that I think sometimes people forget, people like our artisans and our musicians, um, mm-hmm. who are the people who entertain and who, you know, kind of welcome the culture of St. Vincent to visitors, they would have had an immediate impact, you know? And all of that trickles down into the business that I'm in because, you know, we're a communications-based business. We're essentially, an essential service you know more people are making calls everybody has a mobile phone i know very few people who are using landline phones other than in in key in in major businesses so the mobile Mm. phone is your main main source of communication so um you know it challenges the 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 level of spend that you have um just going to telecommunications products and services if you are out of work or laid off or if as a independent worker, which there are many in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, if all of a sudden your income is diminished or, or doesn't exist. So, you know, that has impacted 
um, person's abilities to, to spend on, on products and services in general across many, many industries. I talk to my compatriots um, in, in other industries and in other key businesses and, you know, it's being felt across the board that the, the decrease in spend, um, uh, the decrease in available spend that they have. So people are focused very much on the necessities. Um, what was done here though, and I think done pretty quickly was there was stimulus put in um, by the government. So to support those, first of all, laid off in the tourism industry, that was, that was a major help. And then also more uniquely is they, they actually investing in entrepreneurship through um, grants that are allowing persons if, you know, they have innovative ideas at this point to, to be able to, to get some money, seed money in which they could, you know, start these businesses um, that, that then can give them an opportunity for additional income. But by all means, um, we, we, we have been impacted. The business definitely has been impacted. Areas like roaming, international roaming have been, in, have been impacted because of the, the lack of travel. People aren't coming in. Um, people also aren't going out. So, you know, some of those, mm. those parts of the business are, are really right now, honestly, we can't focus on them because until yeah. the countries open back up and there's international and regional travel again, um, you know, those key areas of the business don't, don't have an opportunity to grow and develop. I've seen figures in the industry, Roman, particularly for tourist islands, as you mentioned, St. Vincent, based in Antigua, uh, as low as 80, 90 percent down, Roman. Um, so, you know, we, we're, a we're a tourist uh, islands, and this is definitely impacting um, operators. Actually, re related to this uh, question, um, I, I want to take a question from my friend um, Ewan Fennell. Uh, and he says, um, how has the pandemic affected collections and new sales in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Um, I'll start with collections. Collections has been challenging. Now, um, early on, um, we, we did take some decisions to really give a, a, a bit of breathing space to, to both our consumer and business customers. Um, in, in the areas of tourism where we knew that they were, they were detrimentally impacted, we were able to work with them um, as, as, again, their trusted advisor and, and partner um, in finding ways to, you know, ease this, the, the, some of the, the stress they were having around monthly payments, being that their operations were now, you know, if not fully shut down, heavily impacted. Um, but collections has been a challenge. Um, what we have seen, though, and what has helped is as the economy has, has stayed open and certain aspects of the economy has continued to, to, to run, um, we, we are seeing an increase in, in our collections now. Um, but we did give a bit of a moratorium period where, where we said, you know okay. what, we're not going to cut customers off and we're mm -hmm. not going to, you know, make it a challenge um, for them to stay connected, being that we see ourselves as an essential service um, in communications. So we did give a period of moratorium where, where we allowed customers a period where they, they, they did not have to pay. Um, but, you know, that was for a, a couple months and we also considered it based on social distancing and these things. Mm -hmm. But we also did give other mechanisms for payment. So, you know, we saw an increase in the use of our My Digital app, um, for instance, and online payment methods also were being used. But we did, we did as, as did other industries um, on the island, you know, give support for some time um, just to get a certain understanding of our new baseline. Um, for where they were, and then and then we reset. But we are seeing improvements in collections now. But it it all comes down to conversations and communication. So we increased speaking to our customers more, both our business customers and consumer customers, understanding where they were, some of the realities and challenges. In some cases, you know, reworking their plans um, so that they would they could stay connected, but um, at, at a more cost effective way, considering that to be less traffic, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, for them at that time. So it, it's something that you have to work through. You know, we are, I, I right. tell people we are customer service business first. Um, we're not perfect at it as no business is, but you know, we are working very, very diligently to make sure that we stay connected to our customers and understand, you know, where they are um, at these various junctures through, through the COVID e experience. So being flexible, adaptable, 
has been key, I think. In, in it's been critical, critical. And on the sales um, conversation, I have to tell you, I think the key, the key part, data is, is critical now. I mean, you have more people doing um, conference calls and doing, you know, or remote learning um, at all levels. I mean, from yes. primary school go up. And so all of that requires connectivity and reliable connectivity. So those have been, that has been, I think, the key product for us that, um, th that, that has been the focus and that has been demand really of, of consumers, um, you know, to Digicel is I need to stay connected online. I need reliable service. I'm still running my business or I'm still, you know, or I still need to stay connected to my family. And so whether it be mobile data on our LTE network or, you know, our fiber infrastructure um, for home and um, business internet, those have been our key, you know, sales drivers. So related to that, um, what, what have you been doing to ensure that uh, your cr critical uh, network infrastructure remains during the, the pandemic? Uh, uh, maybe you can share some of the information of, of that. Sure. I think, you know, first of all, you know, and, and I say this, I, I know I can say this for, for the previous CEOs that, you know, our network engineers and our network O&M teams are the unsung heroes um, of our businesses. If we don't have networks, we don't have a business, you know, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. And so what, what our teams have done, first of all, is our ongoing maintenance to make sure that, you know, that this, the, the network is, is optimized. And what we found is as we've seen increased data traffic, it's also ensuring that we're optimizing the network so that everybody has, you know, there's a singularity of, of good experience across the board. Because we have seen an increase in, 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 in usage, right? Um, where more and more um, customers are using more and more data. Um, some areas of the network have been, you know, you're seeing capacity sometimes as much as 80, 90% on the network. And so there has been ongoing remedial work um, making sure that that the network has, has has stayed consistent through that period, and that is constant work. It's it's not just KPIs; it's also being in the field, and making sure that you're understanding while in the field if the experience of the customer is ideal. So we we've, we've actually continued to do drive testing, continue to do optimization um, to make sure that the experience is again singular across the board. We also have a fiber network that we must maintain. So our fiber mm. team are also out um, making sure that there's no breaks in our fiber connections and that, you right. know, if there's anything coming in from 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 the different notification um, aspects of the business that we are addressing those things immediately and reminding ourselves that Putting the our guys in the field is also making sure that they're safe. So making sure that they have all of the you know personal protective equipment that they need, etc. Because sometimes they're in the field. As I said, we might be asleep, but they're in the field making sure that when we wake up in the morning that we have a network that that's there for us. And so you know they they truly uh, have done a tremendous amount of work to sustain that over this period. Absolutely. Now now Fanta, I I like to have a little commercial. Uh, we're, we're just over halfway through this uh, this interview. I like to have a little commercial, and uh, it's interesting that you spent so much time in, in Trinidad there, because um, I'm going to share something with you, and I hope that you've got your diary and your calendar um, okay. there, because um, 7th to 9th of February 2021 will be the Canto AGM. And guess where it's going to be, Fanta? Trinidad. Yeah, imagine it's in your your native homeland, Trinidad. Yes, and we would yes. love to see you there. So, I, I so now I I've, I'm trying to get you to commit to come to our AGM. And uh, if you need you, you, any, go ahead. Any if you need any assistance, just give me a shout. I, I will. I will. I will. I I, I okay. I you. I can, I will make a commitment to do my best to be there. Right. You know, it's not hard to, 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 to tie me down if I get to come to Trinidad. That's, that's never an issue. And, and, you know, I would love to be part of the Canto experience. Well, um, and in fact, uh, I mean, that's just a short hop, isn't it? Uh, 30 minutes or so. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there you absolutely. go. 
Also, since you have your calendar open, uh, the 25th to the 28th of July, 2021, will be our Canto Conference, God willing, and that will be held in Miami. So, just a couple of dates. I know, I know you CEOs, you've got very busy schedules. Um, yes. Uh, I, I like to, um, we like to see our CEOs come to the conference, so that'd be great to see you there. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'll do my best. <laughs> Okay, great. Hey, let's let's talk about. Um, I'm kind of interested in some of the uh, initiatives that you would have done through the the pandemic period. Were there any uh, sort of new initiatives that you introduced to support citizens during this time? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, f from the from the announcement of our first COVID case here in early March, you know. We, we reached out to the government right away and said, you know, please let us know how we can help. You know, it, it, it wasn't about, um, I didn't know what that looked like. I hadn't manifested it in my mind, but I knew that, you know, it was a, a call to action um, for, for all of us to work together um, to see us through that period. Um, and so immediately the first call I got was from the Ministry of Health and said, we, want, we need to set up a hotline. So we, we assisted with the setup of, of the COVID law hotline here. It's 534-HEAL um, is the number. Oh, nice. um, and, you know, I'm proud to say they've gotten, you know, well over 2,000 calls through, through that, that medium. It's manned by medical professionals. So it's not manned by people who don't know what they're speaking about. It's manned by medical professionals who can guide um, persons through whether they think they're symptomatic, what to do. They've come in contact with somebody who's symptomatic, what they need to do. If they have persons traveling in, what the protocols are. If they're unsure of how to protect themselves, um, all of that it can be provided to them in real time um, through, through the hotline. So I would say that that was a really wonderful initiative. And it was really, I think, within the first week of on the announcement of our first case, we had that hotline set up. So there was an immediate connection that, 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 that the citizens could make to get credible information. As you know, with social media, some, you're getting a lot of information, but it's not always right. It's not always factual. And it was very important for us um, to, and very, very important for the Ministry of Health to make sure there was a, a source that they could connect, that persons to connect with, that would give them the, the truth about what, what COVID was and, and all of the important and pertinent information around it. So we partnered with them in that. And then the second thing that we looked at is there was an immediate disruption of school, right? So, you know, within the first two weeks of, of, of COVID, you know, students were sent home um, and then they would have had this extended Easter at that time, what was, would have been a, a thought to be an extended Easter vacation. During that time, the Ministry of Education um, reached out to us because they had a very audacious plan to roll out remote learning. It was very important for them that they get some level of, you know, of, of the school experience back on track for students. <laughs> Students sitting at home and not 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 getting any you know any education, especially in the ter term, was just not an option for the Ministry of Education. So um, we met with them very early on and came up with some ideas in partnership with them that we thought could work. And so what we did was we rolled out Teams. So Microsoft Teams, as you know, um, mm -hmm. is a again it's it's a, a communications based platform, but it also there was a lot of aspects of Teams that would allow for teachers to be able to post um, content to, to, um, to their students and for students also to be able to interact with the teachers through that medium in a safe, secure environment. So we, were, we worked with the Ministry of Education to roll that out and I'm just gonna, because the numbers are, to me, are just phenomenal. Um, so we had about 20 power users. So these were people who we trained to be really the experts in, in, in Microsoft Teams and be able to do all of the backend administration of Teams for the wider, you know, Ministry of Education. And then we had the IT personnel who we trained. We trained 200 um, of principals and IT, key IT personnel on the platform. And then in terms of teachers and principals, 
um, and, and majority teachers, we trained well over 3,000 people on a Teams call wow. on the platform where experts from Trinidad were able to guide them through how to use the platform and how to troubleshoot in the platform. And the result of that was that we had over 17,000 licenses issued to students. So across the board from primary and secondary school, we had 17,000 students with licenses. It's a personalized license that was given to each student. So it was your name and your school or parts okay. of your name and your school included. So that it was just for you. We had 1,553 faculty licenses issued. So these were the teachers and the staff who were able to then interact on the platform as well. We had conducted 8,392 classes via this medium. Hmm. And that's in 1,131 classrooms across 215 schools. So, and I had to refer to the numbers because I think yeah. it is a testament. And I, and I say this because Digicel understands our role in this. We're a conduit, right? We offer hmm. the connectivity. We can help you with a platform, but by no means was this something that we could have rolled out on our own. The work that the Ministry of Education did, the teachers, the principals, um, the, the permanent secretary, the, the head of curriculum, um, you know, the head teachers, all invested massive amount of time in being able to get on this platform and to be able to deliver you know, remote learning to our students in a way that in an environment that was safe and, and that it was also effective. And I can tell you, I, I'm the mother of two. I have a seven-year-old and, and a 10-year-old. And, and mm -hmm. I could see firsthand the, the, the level of dedication that they went into um, to, to be able to deliver schooling to my children five days a week, typically nine to two o'clock. Um, in all of the key, um, you know, all of the key courses. So their math, their English, their science. Um, they were even doing PE via um, physical this education. As well. Wow! Absolutely. So you know, I can tell you, they reached out to us. They they said, how how can we make this happen? Um, and we we provided the platform, but they absolutely did the work. The, the, you know, all of, of, of the kudos must go to, to them and it's testament um, to the numbers that I, that I just shared that shows just the, the power um, of, of their dedication and what it meant for education in this country. And then, you know, in addition to that, you know, the, the government reached out, uh, Minister uh, Camilo Gonzalez, our, our Minister of Finance reached out and said, listen, we know that there are, there, there are students who will have a challenge, um, you know, if this protracts and is long term, will have a challenge being able to, to, to do this properly. Um, you know, the, the socioeconomic challenges that exist. Mm -hmm. So they asked us to help them um, secure um, tablets as well. So we were able to work with suppliers that we had, um, leveraging the Digicel relationships that we had, and um, we were able to provide um, them with, with access to 3,000 um, tablets that are, that are on island arrived and will be distributed to, to, to key students um, that, that will need it. Um, but what the Ministry of Education has said is that this is the new normal for them, that, that, that the, the online learning um, as, as a means to enhance education is, is something that you know, they, they see as, as part of the future. It's, it's not going to end because of COVID. It'll change undoubtedly, but, they, but what they are seeing is that they, the, the, the experience which, which they were able to get to this point, you know, has given them real drive to see that how they can incorporate this to enrich the education um, process for students across the board. And, you know, there's even now entrepreneurs who are setting up online teaching um, access for not just, um, you know, C, you know, CPA or, or primary school tutelage, but also other courses in terms of, you know, business acumen and accounting and all of these areas that now are Caribbean based, taught by Caribbean tutors and teachers that um, are very cost effective in Caribbean dollars that they can now access. And, and so these platforms are being created now coming out of, of, of what's been done here. Again, Digicel is just a platform. We provide connectivity. The innovative innovation really comes from, from people seeing an opportunity 
and, and being willing to face the challenge. And, and, and I say kudos to the Ministry of Education um, yeah. and, and, to, and to, to them for what I think has been a, a really strong, strong rollout of online learning. I think that's a really good example of, of COVID, you know, and telcos being able to create opportunities uh, out of COVID. Um, so, so let me just ask, you mentioned uh, government and, and uh, I'm also keen to see how the relationship has been going with working with our stakeholders, government, uh, regulators. How's that uh, been going in, in St. Vincent and Grenadines? Well, I think you know everybody is working from from a point of, of of collaboration. I think it's it's how do we come together, um, you know, with government. It's it's been you know things like we've done with education. Um, sometimes it's just to have us in the room to have conversations about what we think the best course of action is, and we've done that. Sometimes it's just an opinion, um, you know. And so I've been you know at different emergency management meetings where you know they talk about you know what what are we doing? How is it working? What is the feedback? Um, because again, I have a call center here. So as much as my call center is not taking calls regarding COVID, we are still getting feedback from customers about how they're, you know, how they're navigating, you know, COVID uh, in, in their own everyday lives. So that's information that we've been able to feed back. Um, and I think, you know, again, with our regulator, I think we have a very, very, um, we have a very strong relationship with our regulator. And what I think I, I must commend with them is, um, as you know, USF funds are, are supposed to be used for, for projects that are supposed to drive innovation. And, right. you know, our, our regulator here um, is, is really doing very unique and interesting projects um, um, with those funds that I think are really, you know, valuable to note because they're nation building, whether it be being able to, to offer low cost um, internet connection um, to, to people who are less privileged um, or innovating in the areas of app development. So, you know, there's the app development workshops that they do, the training that they offer um, in ICT and technology. That's about building, you know, the capacity for what we know is coming. You know, we, there's no going back to pre-COVID, right? In terms of, of experience. It will be, how do we now create a new normal? Um, in, 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 in the new environment. What does that look like, right? More people may work from home. Connectivity will be needed. More apps and applications are going to be required. And Caribbean talent needs to be at the forefront of this as, as well, right? Yes, we can get many of these things outside, but I always believe that the Caribbean point of view is unique and special. Um, and it's something that we need to hold to. And so when you see, you know, your regulator investing in teaching young people how to code, um, which, is the, which is the basic information that you need to be able to build a mobile app. You know, I know that the future is, is in good hands because we're already connecting them with technology early on so that, you know, there, there's, there's, not a, a, and there's not a brain drain because we're also in creating the, the desire and the passion for, for, for technology. We also can create an economy around that that helps to sustain and support them in their islands so that they can, they, they can lead the future. So I think COVID has pushed us, you know, forward probably more so um, than um, maybe we were ready. But what I can tell you is that, you know, the partnerships, through, whether it be through the government and some of the work that they're doing with their grants to support innovation, and what the regulator is doing to make sure that the access is there to the to the training and development of the people who want to be part of the technology ecosystem, they're alive and well in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You know, I, I think that's really commendable uh, of the regulator in St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, that uh, they have all these uh, local projects for the Universal Service Fund and it's being utilized. Um, I think that's really, really commendable. And uh, funny enough, you, you've gone on to Universal Service Fund and you must be a mind reader. Is that, that's actually one of the questions that popped up. Has the US, USF Fund uh, been accessed? So you've answered that one uh, before I've even asked the question. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So um, we, we've only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, and and uh, so let me try and pick up some of these questions coming in now. Um, and one of the questions was, uh, how are you dealing with connectivity in the multiple islands, especially after the recent hurricanes? Um, uh, um, well, I must tell you, first of all, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been extremely fortunate, um, you know, to really have, you know, made it through at least the last few hurricane seasons quite unscathed. Um, I cannot say the same for some of my sister islands, such as Dominica, you know. Um, yeah. We really have not had major infrastructural issues on island um, during those periods. But as I've said before, I think the thing that, that, that ensures that we are poised and ready for as ready as you can be for when something like that occurs is the continuous maintenance of the network. So we now have two networks. Um, we have a fiber network now that is terrestrial fiber across the country, then subsea fiber through the Grenadines, and then also our, our, our traditional GSM network um, as well with towers right through St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So it's a constant you know, m maintenance and, and staying observant and staying diligent in the maintenance of the networks that, that ensure that you know that we have limited disruptions um, during times of, of 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 challenging weather. But as I said, and I knock wood, and I you know we 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 continue to pray um, as we we are in a hurricane period now that that we can weather this year's um, um, season as well. But by no means um, you know is it something that that we do not you know continuously ensure that we're paying very close contention, attention to. My principal belief is. We have a fiduciary responsibility to keep this network up. It is the lifeline for many people. We have a responsibility to our customers to make sure that they are connected, particularly in times of, of challenge and difficulty. So um, I'm always at, at my network guys to make sure that they have everything they need to do what they do. They are exceptional at what they do. They are the experts. It is solely my job to ensure that I remove the barriers um, that may come into place that may keep them from being able to do what it is they need to do. Um, Cindy, Miller, Cindy Miller says, so impressive and glad to hear about you know, the Universal Service Fund, but especially admire the approach on COVID and how few cases are active in St. Vincent. So that's uh, some nice feedback there. Thank um, you. Another question uh, coming in was, what percentage of children have access to online classes? Um, what did the government do to give access to the neighborhoods that are financially challenged? Uh, well, remember, again, with the USF funds, um, uh, all of the community centers um, across the country would have um, free Wi-Fi access. And then what we did with the Teams platform as well is it's a zero rated platform. So you actually oh. didn't have to have credit or buy app. You didn't have to have data on your phone or, or anything like that to be able to access the Teams platform. It was a zero rated platform um, for, for, for students to connect to. Um, and as I said, um, they moved extremely quickly to roll this out. So again, it was the, the access to getting the tablets, which I have to tell you, it was a major challenge at the time because I think the whole world was doing this all at the same time. Yes. Um, but a lot of what we found that, that, that occurred was, you know, where schools could, they would provide the access there. The community centers also did their part. And as I said, you know, what has been done by, by our regulator is they've given access for, for internet connection in a lot of the areas where, where they would be economically disadvantaged persons. Um, but it all started with being able to access it regardless of whether you had internet access or not. In terms of the percentage of students, um, I can tell you how many connections we have. Um, but if we're seeing 215 schools accessed, I think we have a large majority of the schools that would have been connected to the program at the time. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, something you, you mentioned earlier, um, which caught my eye, was that you, you actually have a call center. in, in yes, yes. yes, we do. And, and so how did that go, um, you know, keeping the call center 
sort of up and running during the, the well, those early days? Um, yes, yes. Well, the first thing that we did um, to keep the call center running was we, we, we provided transportation for all call center staff. So the first thing was mitigate the risk from home to work. So everybody had to wear masks, everybody sanitized, but they would be picked up at their homes um, and then we would drop them back home. And it's actually something that we've continued to do. Um, once we know there's active cases in the market, that's what we've continued to do. So the first thing was to make sure that we can get them to and from work safely. Um, where we determined that we could work from home, if we could work some of the aspects of our, our call center teams from home, particularly those who are working on digital, because we do inbound calls, so you can't call into the center via 100, but also if you go through our, our, our My Digicel app, you can actually speak live to an agent as well. So we also provide digital services as well. So um, at times our digital teams, because of their ability, you know, because of the nature of what they did, they, they were able to work from home. And we also staggered our call center staff. So half would work from home, half would work, work, work at the office, and we would do that um, in a rotation. And some of that can still continues now. Um, but it's been a number of different things that we've done based on the ability of, of the team to be effective in terms of, of meeting our service levels. So we, we've been very agile in how we've approached, um, you know, making sure that our staff is safe but also that we've been able to, to hold to, to our um, commitment to making sure that, that, um, that customers can get to us. And, um, you know, we run our call center eight to eight, seven, uh, seven days a week. But I have to say overall, and, and just, you know, as, as you know, we're, we're closing, is that, you know, the resilience of, of my team has been phenomenal. What has been asked of them has not been easy to work from home. And in many cases, they're also homeschooling because that would have been happening simultaneously. And I cannot say that there were key disruptions in our business at any time. And that really is a testament to the dedication of, of the staff here. We're just under a hundred staff, um, including the call center. And I think everybody has done their level best um, to stay focused and stay committed to the business. Um, and, and, and ensuring that we've been able to deliver on our promise to our customers. And I want to say to them publicly, thank you. Thank you for, for weathering what has been a very challenging period. Um, and, and they've done it with grace and they've done it with fortitude and it would be impossible to sit here and, and speak on this business without recognizing the, the collective efforts of, of our managers and all of our staff who've all uh, done their part, including our community ambassadors, because we also have community ambassadors who work and represent the brand in their communities on our behalf, our resellers who continue to make sure that there was sufficient recharge in the channels, um, our retail partners all have done their part to keep this business going, and, and I truly appreciate their hard work and dedication. Well, you know, Fanta, um, I could talk to you all day. But unfortunately, time, time has caught us up. And uh, yes. thank you so much for a very informative session. Um, I, I, uh, and I can't wait to come back to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And, well, as soon uh, as the flights happen, you have an open invitation, Julian. You know that. And thank you very much for the time today. And thank you to everyone for the wonderful questions. Um, you know, they were truly appreciated. So thanks again, Fanta. So to our audience, thank you very much for your time this morning. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, remember, our next webinar will be on Tuesday, 21st of July at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Ms. Phyllis Reed Jarvis, and she's CEO of ultimate pot potentials, sharing with us pathways for sustaining healthy families and organizations. So thank you. And remember, you can work from anywhere, stay safe, and stay connected with Canto Conversations. Goodbye. <laughs>